Got him right through the pump with this. And fired so close, the powder burned his overcoat. Archer didn't have time to draw. His gun was tucked away in his hip pocket. Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, formerly known as iTunes, or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. So please subscribe when you're finished listening. You can also go to ClassicMovieRev.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Today's movie is The Maltese Falcon, 1931. Okay, I'll say it. My entire logos is based on the fact that there has never been a good remake of a movie, so all we need are the classics. The simple fact that this movie exists, and the other version, Satan Met a Lady, 1936, means that The Maltese Falcon, 1941, which is possibly the greatest film ever made, is a remake. Life is getting hard. This film was also played in the 1950s as Dangerous Female since the 1941 version was so popular. Directed by Roy Del Ruth, this film is rated 7.3 on imdb.com, and I think that's fairly accurate. In a very good and in-depth review, Danny from Precode.com stated on December 1, 2004, quote, The biggest flaw in the Maltese Falcon would have to be the lack of tension, though that may be the wrong word for it. Still an early talkie, director Roy Del Ruth from Blonde Crazy and the Mind Reader has trouble keeping the plot in focus. The sudden appearance of the ship's captain in Spade's office is baffling, and Wilmer's appearance is quite late in this movie, considering just how integral he turns out to be to the plot. But that's my biggest and probably only complaint about this picture. The Maltese Falcon is a corker of a film. It's an interesting study of a man that's not just stated, but explored in its many modulations, a riddle that remains what makes a person a person and what makes a statue of a black bird seem so unique and extraordinary, and how both of them turn out to be something much more mundane. Unquote. Under the title Mysteries Galore, an anonymous New York Times film critic wrote on May 29, 1931, quote, It appears that Roy Del Ruth has done splendidly by an excellent mystery story and given wilted entertainment seekers a decent excuse for getting out of the heat. There also seems no reasonable doubt that Mr. Del Ruth has really set a detective story moving on the screen without losing any of the suspenseful diversions it is reputed to have offered between book covers, unquote. Even in the great 1941 movie, the ship captain shows up mysteriously in Humphrey Bogart's office or Sam Spade's office. Also, Wilmer comes in fairly late, too. So I don't know about all those criticisms. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. Dwight Fry was cast in the role of Wilmer Cook. Fry was first covered in episode 10, Bride of Frankenstein, 1935. Bebe Daniels played the femme fatale Ruth Wonderly. She was born in Texas in 1901. Her mother was an actress and she began working on stage at the age of four. She started her film career at the age of seven. When she was 14, producer Hal Roach brought her to co-star with comedian Harold Lloyd. She was next coerced by Cecil B. DeMille to sign with Paramount. She did well there with movies like Why Change Your Wife, 1920, The Speed Girl, 1921, Rio Rita, 1929, The Maltese Falcon, 1931, and 42nd Street, 1933. She married Ben Lyon in 1930 and the pair moved to England. Bebe was a successful stage actress, and she and her husband had a radio show that lasted through World War II. Her last film was The Lions Abroad, 1955. Bebe died in 1971. Ricardo Cortez did a good job as Sam Spade. Cortez was born in 1900 in New York City. I'm walking here! I'm walking here! Cortez was born a Jewish immigrant. He worked odd jobs as he learned to act. He followed his cinematographer brother to Hollywood in 1922. They quickly turned him into competition for Rudolph Valentino. Although he never replaced Valentino, he did become very popular with films like Argentine Love, 1924, Pony Express, 1924, The Cat's Pajamas, 1926, The Maltese Falcon, 1931, Is My Face Red, 1932, A Lost Lady, 1934, 
Manhunt 1936, and The Case of the Black Cat 1936. However, his roles were disappearing. He directed for a time, but eventually returned to New York. He went to work on Wall Street and was very successful. He died in 1977. Dudley Diggs was cast as Casper Gutman. Diggs was born in Dublin, Ireland in 1879. Diggs worked in Irish theater for two years before moving to the U.S. He was a successful Broadway actor from 1906 to 1947. He was a director as well as an actor. His films include The Maltese Falcon, 1931, The Invisible Man, 1933, The Emperor Jones, 1933, Mutiny on the Bounty, 1935, and Raffles, 1939. He died in 1947. Una Merkel played the role of Effie Prine. Merkel was born in 1903 in Kentucky. The first time she was filmed, it was as a stand-in for Lillian Gish during the filming of The Wind, 1928. She went back to work on Broadway, but was called back by director D.W. Griffith for Abraham Lincoln, 1930. It quickly became clear that Merkel fit better in comedies. Some of her better films include The Maltese Falcon, 1931, Private Lives, 1931, 42nd Street, 1933, Destry Rides Again, 1939, where she is in a hair-pulling cat fight with Marlene Dietrich that ended when Jimmy Stewart's character drenched them with water, Summer and Smoke, 1961, for which she received a Best Supporting Actress Oscar nomination, and The Parent Trap, 1961. Merkel died in 1986 at the age of 82. Thelma Todd played the loose Iva Archer. Todd was born in Massachusetts in 1906. Following high school, Todd began studying to be a school teacher. She also entered beauty pageants and won Miss Massachusetts in 1925 and went to the Miss America pageant. She began working in film at the age of 21. Her best known films include Fascinating Youth, 1926, God Gave Me 20 Cents, 1926, Nevada, 1927, The Gay Defender, 1927. Dollar Dizzy, 1930. Follow Through, 1930. Let's Do Things, 1931. On the Loose, 1931. Speak Easily, 1932. The Old Bull, 1932. Monkey Business, 1931. And Horse Feathers, 1932 with the Marx Brothers. This is the Night, 1932. Twin Triplets, 1935. The Missing Stooge, 1935. Films released after her death are Hot Money, 1936, An All-American Toothache, 1936, and The Bohemian Girl, 1936, which she was mostly cut out of. While she was acting, Thelma and her husband opened a restaurant slash nightclub. There's an unconfirmed rumor that gangsters tried to take over the club for illegal gambling. It is said that the pair refused the gangsters making powerful enemies. In December 1935, Thelma was found dead in her car inside her garage. She died from carbon monoxide poisoning. There were rumors of gangsters and cover-ups. But the death was ruled a suicide, although her friends said she was never depressed. She was 29 years old. Otto Matisson played the generic European Dr. Joel Cairo. Matisson was born in 1893 in Copenhagen, Denmark. He is known for a few films that include Scaramouche, 1923, The Silver Treasure, 1926, Behind Closed Doors, 1929, and the Maltese Falcon, 1931. He was killed in a car accident in 1932. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. The movie opens with a shot of Pier 51 and the skyline of San Francisco. It travels to the office of Spade and Archer, private detectives. Sam Spade, Ricardo Cortez, is ushering his latest romantic conquest out of the office under the smirking looks of his secretary, Effie Pride, Una Merkel. Spade goes back into his office and begins cleaning his love nest. Effie lets him know that a lady, a real looker, wants to meet him. And that was looker, not hooker. There's a girl outside to see you, Sam. Her name's Wonderly. A customer? I guess so. You'll see her anyway. She's a knockout. Okay, honey. Send her in. Ruth Wonderly, Bebe Daniels, is brought into the office. She is more believable as an object of desire than Mary Astor from the 41 version. Wonderly explains that her sister has run off with a dangerous man, Floyd Thursby, and she needs to get her back before her parents return from Europe. 
Effie gets a call from Spade's partner's wife, I have an archer, Thelma Todd, and she wants to talk to Sam. She is talking about love and such. Miles Archer, Walter Long, comes into the outer office and listens in on the phone call. He bursts into the meeting, but calms down when he sees the client. When she pays him $200, Archer decides to take the case. They split the money. Spade gets a call shortly after 1 a.m. that Miles Archer has been murdered. He goes to the hotel where Thursby was to be followed. Detective Sergeant Tom Polehouse, J. Farrell McDonald, tells that Archer was shot at very close range. They expect Spade to tell Iba about her husband's death. The police are shocked that Spade doesn't want to examine the body. Hello, Sam. Hello, Tom. I thought you'd want to take a look at the body before we took it away. Got him right through the pump with this. And fired so close, the powder burned his overcoat. Archer didn't have time to draw. His gun was tucked away in his hip pocket. I guess it's up to you to break the news to the widow, ain't it? Yeah, I guess so. Say, ain't you going to take a look at him before you go? What's the use, Tom? You've seen him. Nothing I can do to bring him to life. When Spade heads out, he stops for a short conversation with a Chinese merchant in the alley. They speak in Chinese, and the content of the conversation is not revealed. About 3 a.m., Sergeant Polehouse and Detective Lieutenant Dundee, Robert Elliott, come to Spade's apartment. Spade is drunk and on the couch. When Dundee smarts off, Spade calls him sweetheart. Come on in, precious. Who were you expecting, darling? You, sweetheart. They ask what Archer was doing that night. They catch Spade in a lie because Effie was sent to tell Iva about her husband's death. Dundee tells Spade that Thursby was shot 35 minutes after Spade left the murder scene. Spade goes to talk to Wonderly. A copy of The Strange Story of the Little Black Bird is on the sofa. Spade is pretty curt with Wonderly, and he brings up her sister, and she admits she was lying. He says he knew all along she was lying. Wonderly says she can't explain right now, and she drops the line, Be generous, Mr. Spade. He mocks her. She tells the, quote, truth about Thursby. She says they came from the Orient together, and he betrayed her. She keeps saying she's afraid and doesn't know who killed Thursby. Spade asks Wonderly how much money she has, and she replies $500. When she hands it over, it is only $400. He demands the other $100 and leaves. After he's gone, she shows a roll of money as big as a fist. Spade goes back to the office and tells Effie to have the name of Archer removed from the door. Effie comes in and tells Spade there is a gorgeous customer outside, and he happily says, send her in. Effie lets Dr. Joel Cairo, Otto Matisson, into the office. Cairo is a small, well-groomed, indistinct European with a Van Dyke mustache. Cairo introduces himself and says he will pay $5,000 for help finding an ornament for one of his clients. Cairo says it's the black figure of a bird. Effie checks out and leaves for the night. Cairo pulls a gun and orders Spade to place his hands behind the back of his neck. $5,000 is a lot of money. You will please clasp your hands together at the back of your neck. What are you doing? Kidding me? You will please clasp your hands together at the back of your neck. Okay, doctor. When Cairo tries to search Spade, Spade disarms him and knocks him out. Cairo only has a few dollars in his wallet. After he awakes, Cairo says the bird is about 12 inches tall. After they make a deal, Spade returns the gun. Cairo pulls the gun and searches the office. This time Spade lets him. When Spade gets back to his apartment, Wonderly is waiting there. Spade says he saw Cairo and Wonderly is caught a little flat-footed. Spade tells her he thinks he is going to work for Cairo for the $5,000. Wonderly puts on full vamp. Sam goes along. Don't you ever get... Lonesome. Sometimes. They are interrupted by a buzz from the door. Sergeant Polehouse and Lieutenant Dundee are there to ask Spade more questions. Spade won't let them in, and the cops ask about the affair with Iva and say that it could be the cause of Archer's murder. 
Saw your light. Thought we'd come up and talk to you. Go ahead and talk. Love him, Mike. You're not going to make a stand out here, are you? Afraid you'll have to, Tom. I can't let you in. So you won't play along with us. Still going it alone. Say what's on your mind besides your hat. Just this. There's a lot of talk going around that you and Archer's wife were pretty thick. Any truth in it? No. There's even talk that's why he was put on the spot. Wonderly screams from inside of the apartment. When the cops bust in, Wonderly is holding a gun on Cairo. Cairo says she hit him over the head and was going to murder him. Spade starts laughing and pretends it was just a misunderstanding between his friends. Cairo asks to leave along with the police. Wonderly decides to stay the night. Spade says she can have the bedroom and he will sleep in the den. They start snuggling and Spade asks her about the black bird. Wonderly distracts him with a kiss and stuff. In the morning, Spade goes through Wonderly's purse and finds a key for room 301 at the Carondelet Apartments. He goes to the apartment and begins searching. It is the most thorough search I have ever seen filmed. He returns to his apartment with a bag of food and Wonderly pulls her gun. The buzzer on the door rings and it's Iva Archer. Spade steps out into the hall with her. She forces her way in and sees Wonderly who is wearing Iva's kimono. I saw wearing my kimono. She says she will go to Lieutenant Dundee if Spade doesn't talk to her before she leaves. Spade goes back into the apartment and Wonderly is taking a bath. Spade gets a note to come to room 900 Palace Hotel to learn about the Black Bird. The note is signed by Casper Gutman. Casper Gutman, Dudley Diggs, is a large, sweaty man. He seems friendly at first. Gutman tells the story of the Black Bird back to the time of the Crusades and the Order of St. John. The black bird is supposed to be a gold bird encrusted with large jewels. Gutman tells the story of the bird popping up over time and how he found its location and had it stolen by his gang. Gutman thinks Spade can deliver the falcon, and he offers him up to half a million dollars after the sale of the bird. Spade takes the deal with a deposit of $1,000. A young Wilmer Cook, Dwight Fry, wearing an overcoat and his driver's cap, comes into the room and announces that the doctor has arrived. Gutman leaves the room. When Gutman gets to the other room, Cairo is there. Cairo says Spade doesn't have the bird and they should get rid of him. Cairo then says that Captain Jacoby, Angostino Borgato, of the ship La Paloma is arriving in the city before midnight. Jacoby and Wonderly were friends in Hong Kong and they think she may have given the bird to Jacoby. Gutman signals his attendant to give a Mickey Finn to Spade. Spade passes out as Gutman laughs. Of course, Gutman takes his thousand dollars back. Sometime after midnight, Spade makes it back to his office. Effie is sleeping at his desk. Just then, Captain Jacoby stumbles into the office. He has been shot. He drops the suitcase and then dies. Spade searches him and then looks in the suitcase. It has the initials RW the same as the suitcase in Wonderly's room. They open the bag and surrounded by hay is the falcon, covered in shiny black enamel. Sam, what is that? Honey, it's the blackbird they're all after. I don't know why it's so valuable, but it's worth a fortune. Sam, whoever shot that captain will do the same to you. I'm afraid, get rid of it. Oh, stop worrying, honey, I'll take care of it. Spade checks the bag with the falcon into the train depot storage area. He puts a claim check in an envelope and mails it to a P.O. box. When he drops the letter, Sergeant Polehouse is right behind him. Polehouse says the district attorney wants to see Spade because Iva Archer has been complaining. They question Spade, but he doesn't give him any information. The D.A. says Spade has 24 hours before they arrest him for Archer's murder. When Spade gets home, Wonderly is waiting again. They go to his apartment and find Gutman, Cairo, and Wilmer. Wilmer holds a gun on Spade. Gutman says they all know he has the Falcon. Spade asks for payment, but Gutman only gives him $10,000. This is actual coin. Permit me to remind you, Mr. Spade. You may have the Falcon, but we most certainly have you. Oof. I'm not going to let that worry me. Spade says they need a fall guy for the three murders. Spade recommends Wilmer, and Gutman refuses. My dear sir, it's too ridiculous. 
Why, I feel toward Wilma exactly as if he were my own son. Well, you can easily pick another son, but there's only one blackbird. Then Spade recommends Cairo. Cairo recommends Spade or Wonderly. Spade then tells the group that he can't get the falcon until daylight. They send Wonderly to cook. Sexist. They take the money envelope from Wonderly before she leaves, and there is $9,000 now. Spade goes into the kitchen to check Wonderly for the money. He forces her to undress. As she undresses, she throws her clothes to Spade. Spade goes outside and makes Gutman admit that he stole the $1,000. Spade says the fall guy will be Wilmer. Cairo burns Gutman's ear about Wilmer, and when Spade needles him, Wilmer pulls his gun. Spade knocks him out. Gutman and Cairo accept Wilmer as the fall guy. Spade calls Effie, who is asleep at home. He tells her how to get the suitcase and says she should bring it to his apartment in the morning. Gutman says Wilmer killed Thursby and implies that he killed Jacoby as well. Spade looks at Wonderly, who is cheating at solitary, and tries to figure her out. The others are all asleep. They all slowly wake up. Effie rings the buzzer and drops off the suitcase. Gutman opens it with rapt excitement. Wilmer uses this time to escape out the kitchen window. Gutman takes a knife and carves the enamel on the bird and finds it to be a fake. Gutman, Cairo, and Wonderly start fighting because they have messed up the theft so badly. They think the Russian in Constantinople pulled the switch. This is a fake. This is not the real Falcon. But it's the only one I know about. You have had your little joke. Why don't you tell them where the real one is? Oh, no, Sam. I swear this is the one I got from Kamadov. That's it. But the Russian, Kamadov. You have bungled the whole thing, you fathead. They decide to go back to try again. Gutman pulls a gun and demands the $10,000 back from Spade. Gutman and Cairo leave the room. Spade calls Sergeant Polehouse and tells about the three crooks. Along now, Spade starts to quiz Wonderly about why she killed Archer. He knew it was a woman because he was shot at such close range. Let me get this straight with you. What, darling? You and Cairo double-crossed Gutman, and then you ditched Cairo in favor of Thursby, is that right? Something like that. Yes. Just why did you give the blackbird to Jacoby? I was afraid that Thursby couldn't be trusted. That Gutman might buy him over. That's a lie. You had him hooked and you knew it. What was your scheme for disposing of uh, Thursby? I thought if he saw that Archer was following him, it might frighten him into leaving town. I didn't think he'd really shoot Archer. Well, if you thought that you were right, Thursby never killed Archer. Oh, I know Archer was dumb but not dumb enough to let Thursby catch him up a blind alley with his gun stuck away in his hip pocket and his overcoat button. But he'd have gone up that alley with you, honey. After a bit, she confesses that she thought Thursby would get blamed for Archer's death. Sam says he loves her, but he's not going to play the sap. She tries to kiss him into compliance. Sergeant Polehouse and Lieutenant Dundee come in and tell them that Wilmer killed Gutman in Cairo. They ask Spade about Archer's murder. Spade turns in wonderly. They take her in and she gets snotty on the way out. A newspaper headline shows that the three murders have been solved and Wonderly was found guilty. It also tells that Spade produced a witness at trial, Li Fu Gao, a Chinese merchant that Spade talked to in the alley. Gao identified Wonderly as the killer of Archer. So Spade knew all along. Spade goes to see Wonderly in prison. You just couldn't keep away from me, could you? Well, not when I've got good news for you. Good news? You just made me chief investigator for the district attorney's office. He tells her that he is now the lead investigator for the district attorney because of her. When he leaves, he asks the matron to give her anything she needs. Spade says to build the DA's office and he will approve the bill. I want you to be very nice to that girl on number 10. Give her anything she wants. Good food, cigarettes, and candy. You know what I mean. Very well, Sam, just as you say. But who will I charge it to? Send the bill to the district attorney's office. I'll okay it. World famous short summary. Dane plays a game where she misunderstands the skill of her opponent. Hope you enjoyed today's show. 
I really appreciate you spending the time listening. You can find connections to social media and email on the site at classicmoviereb.com. There are links in the podcast show notes as well. Remember, this show is completely free and independent. If you get a chance, jump over to Apple Podcasts and give the show a review. It really helps the show get found. Beware the moors. <laughs>